Now we've had some different lessons from different families that we've looked at in the Bible where we started with Adam and Eve and, and uh, Noah and Abraham and Isaac and last week we talked about, or two weeks ago rather, we talked about how Isaac and Rebecca came together when Abraham sent out <clears throat> his servant. That was an interesting thing. And then tonight I want to talk about Jacob. Now, after Jacob was born to where we pick up his life story in Genesis chapter 35, Jacob was quite the guy. And uh, if you don't know everything about Jacob's life, just go back to the, well, you got to go back several chapters here and read about him. <clears throat> but the, he's the guy that uh, connived his brother out of his birthright. And then uh, also him and his mom got together and they, well, they got together and did that. And then he took the blessing away from his uh, brother, his brother Esau, both times. And uh, Esau eventually was not a friend, a fan of his brother Jacob, but then ultimately they got right. But there's a whole lot in between all of that stuff as well that you can read about. But it did happen that later on in life when Jacob was living with his uncle Laban that uh, he wanted to marry Rachel, but it turned out he worked seven years for Rachel, but you might, you might remember that uh, that came back. Some of his scheming came back to bite him a little bit when uh, he ended up with a different woman than he expected to what he was going to get. He had Leah. So then he had to work another seven years, and then he ended up with Rachel, and then he worked six more years, and he finally left. And uh, he's out doing what God would have him to do. So we pick up there, and, but all of this stuff in between his life that had happened previous to, you'll just have to go back <clears throat> and read about it. Why don't you stand with me, and I'm going to pick up... Uh, here in chapter 35 and verse 1, I'm going to read 15 verses to you. <clears throat> God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, which is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. That was Esau. But Deborah, uh, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Elion Batah. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Pandanaram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went out up from him in the place where he had talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. Father, we're asking you to add now your blessing upon the reading of your word and upon the teaching and the preaching of it to the principles and thoughts that we're going to bring out from this text. I pray that it'll help somebody here tonight. I pray, God, that you would work a work of grace that only you can do through your spirit. We pray for an anointing. We pray for a filling of the spirit of God once again uh, as we look at the word of God. Help everybody to listen with a spiritual ear. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So Jacob, <clears throat> we're going to talk about tonight, is the family who actually came back to God. He got away, but he came back. If you look here in the story that we read, Jacob took his family, verses 2 and 3, 
And uh, God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there in the land. And in verse 2 it said, And Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. That's important. And change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. So Jacob took his family, and he took them to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. I will tell you what a blessing it is to see families in the house of God together. It's a blessing. The church is the house of God. And when people make much of the house of God, it is a joy. I mean, it is just a joy to see families in the church house. And it's always a help to everybody. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the church is God's house. I said this last week. The church is not a social club. That's not what we're here for. It's not the place to exchange ideas while the choir is singing or while somebody, somebody is singing a solo or while the preacher is preaching or while the offertory is being played on the piano or some other instrument. I said some of that this morning. The church is not a fundraising institution where we raise funds for all different kinds of things. Uh, that's not what we do. We fellowship a lot, but that is not what the church is about. The church is the house of God, and it's a house of prayer and preaching and teaching God's word, those things are paramount in the church. The prayer time, the preaching time, the teaching time, the worship time, I mean, this is a house of prayer. And that's what God wants it to stay. So in verse 1, it said that God said, God spoke to a man, God is speaking to you, God is speaking to me, and uh, not in an audible voice, but from the pages of the word of God and from sermons that you read. By the way, I don't say this too often, but every once in a while. I'll tell you, a good way to learn your Bible is to read sermons. Just pick up a sword of the Lord. We don't get them in, but we're going to start getting them back now. But getting a sword of the Lord and, uh, you know, pick them up and read the sermons that are in there and maybe get some books on sermons. I have several books on sermons, and you read some of those sermons in there. You'll be amazed what you can learn by reading sermon. But God is speaking to us, and maybe not an audible voice like he spoke to Jacob here, but God is speaking. And uh, there is no extra biblical revelation that somebody is getting today. There's no writing in the sky. There's no uh, it's the signs and wonders stuff and all that crazy stuff. There are 66 books in the Bible, in the Scripture. It's profitable, and it's all that we need to know and all that God wants us to know is in the Word of God. Now, I want us guys to recognize that God spoke to Jacob. God could be speaking to you. Be sensitive to the voice of God. God might be speaking to the ladies, because God speaks to ladies as well. You are to be sensitive to the voice of God as well. I'm saying all of us need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God as He speaks to our hearts and as He prompts our hearts to do what God wants us to do. But we need good, godly people. We need good, godly men. We need good, godly women. I've heard women ask this question, guys. Where are all the godly men? That's a good question. That's a fair question. She was a single lady, by the way, that asked that question, just so you might know. But she where are all the godly men? Did you know women need a godly man, and, and that's what most women want? But God said in verse 1 to Jacob, he said, arise and go. And Jacob said in verse uh, 3, okay. And in verse 3, he said, let's go. So they get up and they go. Now, when God tells you to do something and you do it, what do you call that? Obedience. You're just doing what God told you to do. That's all he's saying. So we, that's really when God tells us to do something, we ought to just do it. We shouldn't argue. We shouldn't try to get him to fashion his robe of righteousness just the way we want it. Put yourself in a position where he can tailor your life so his robe of righteousness fits on you just right. That's how we need to be. When God spoke to Jacob, Jacob said, I'll go. I'll do it. What a, what a wonderful attitude. Now listen, if you don't know who Jacob was, I mentioned this earlier, but go back and read about him. Any kind of description of him defies imagination of some of the things that this guy did in his younger days. He was a schemer. 
He was a supplanter. He tricked his brother a couple of times. He connived with his father-in-law. Uh, he just was something. But in verse 10, it said this. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. God changed his name, but more importantly, God changed his life. The guy that was the Jacob that we didn't read about, he's not that man anymore. He's a new man. He's living a godly life and a righteous life. And it won't be Jacob the surplanter, but it'll be Israel. Israel means a prince of God. Every born-again believer can be a prince of God. His 12 sons, you probably know, make up the 12 tribes of Israel. He and his family did some things that all of us need to do. I'm going to mention in a moment. God told him to get up to Bethel, and he said, there you can get right with God. Bethel, the house of God. It is there that you get right with God. Now, there are three things necessary in order for us to be right with God. These are introductory statements. They're not the sermon outline. Three things are necessary. First of all, certain things need to be given up. They, they have to be given up. Paul said, put off the old man. He also said, put on the new man. But he said, put off the old man. There is a certain amount of sacrifice to give up that we have to do to get right with God. It is not what we leave, but what we receive that causes us to rejoice in Christ. We don't mourn over the things that God's word instructs us to give up. We rejoice in what God has given us to replace those things. So there are certain things that need to be given up. Jacob told these guys, you know, get rid of the idols. And then secondly, be in the right place, doing the will of God. Do you know how you define success? Finding the will of God and doing it. If you do that, you're a successful person. There's some people that are, you know, just, just want to make more money and make more money and make more money. You can make all the money in the world you want to make, <clears throat> but that does not guarantee you're a success in God's eyes. You are to find the will of God and do it. And then thirdly, certain things need to be done. So we put off the old man, and then we put on the new man. You have to work at having a good, solid family. You have to work at having a good, solid life. A lot of these things just don't happen. You have certain responsibilities. One of the things we talked about some in Sunday school this morning was temperance, self-control. You have to have that. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. You need to be faithful to church. You need to give. You need to witness and share your faith. You need to serve the Lord. You have to do certain things to be right with God. They're mandatory. As Jacob was going up to Bethel, what did he do? Well, what did he do to get right with God? I want you to notice, first of all, verses 1 and 2. God said unto Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, notice what he said, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. You know what he said? we got to do away with idols. An idol is anything that takes the place of God in my life or in your life. That's an idol. None of you have a, I doubt that any of you have a statue at home of Buddha or <laughs> something like that. You don't have any of that stuff where you go and you kneel before it and pray. Nobody has that. But we have our idols. And those are anything that takes the place of God, that takes your devotion, that takes your affection, that takes your love that should be given to God, that's an idol. We have our idols. There's the idol of pleasure. Some care more for pleasure than they do for God. And some care more for pleasure than they do God's house. Now, that wouldn't be you because you're here tonight. But there are some people that aren't here tonight that could be here tonight. So we have our idols. <clears throat> we have anywhere from, I don't know what the numbers are now, but several people that are out of church every week. And some of them are legitimate reasons. And it's hard to tell who's out and who's not out 
if they're staying away just because of the pandemic is running wild in Oneida County, although I think they're coming down, uh, or if they're just like, you know what, I kind of like this. I kind of like watching the internet church and drinking coffee and eating a donut while I'm sitting here on my couch, and a, you know, uh, which really to me isn't, I mean, you do it in, in absolutely necessary. I think the only other time, I've looked into this a little bit, the only other time that I can ever remember a boarding, that I've ever found that they boarded up the churches in America was in 1918 when they boarded up everything because of the, the Spanish flu, which was way worse than this thing. But anyway, uh, you, the churches aren't really boarded up, but some people have chosen because of health reasons to stay home, but that's not true for everybody. Some people are staying home because they find it convenient. I will tell you something. It does not replace the assembly of the church family together. But we have several people that miss every week. Sometimes, sometimes people are out on the golf course. So I, was ta I forget who I was talking to. It was back in like April. And uh, it was a pastor's wife in they were calling, you know, everybody was out everywhere doing all kinds of things instead of watching church on television or even then, they were just doing whatever they were doing. Now, when we went out, Amy asked me who we watched. We usually watched Charles Stanley or David Jeremiah because they were the ones we get. We don't, we don't have all this fancy cable stuff and all that, but we got those. And uh, so we took the Sunday morning and, and we went in and, uh, you know, we, we, sat, we sat on a couch there and we got dressed. We weren't in our pajamas. We actually got, girls got dressed nice usually. And then we sat there and we, 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 we did it on that. But that's not like being assembled together. But some people weren't even doing that. They were going hiking and they were going whatever they were doing, they were doing. Now listen, that's, that's not how you get right with God. Some people were out on their boat. A, pastor called, a pastor's wife called the pastor, and she found he was out on his boat doing something. They weren't in New York, obviously. You're not out on your boat in the middle of uh, Mar March. But anyway, they were doing something. It says, God, you're not as important to me as these other things are. So we have to make God, get the idols got to go. Money, popularity, possessions, sometimes they come before God. And sometimes they become idols. The first thing Jacob did was get rid of the idols, and he told others to do the same thing. They quit using God's day to, their own, to do their own thing, and they started using God's day to do holy things. Fathers, we can't use God's house and God's day any way we want to and expect God to be thrilled and happy with us and for God to pour out his blessings upon us. You, can't even do good, you can even do good things, but... You shouldn't do good things to the exclusion of the best things. You should always do the best things. So the best thing is, in this text, remember the Lord's Day. Our houses, our children, our cars, our boats, our pleasures, our money, our material possessions and popularity and fame, they can all become idols as we give our affection and devotion and our love to them rather than to God. So the first thing he says is, put away your idols. Get those out of your life. It's not wrong to have things. It's not wrong. I think I said this a couple weeks ago, maybe, maybe last week. The family that plays together stays together, just like the family that prays together stays together. It's not wrong to have fun and enjoyment and go on a vacation or whatever you do. Not a thing wrong with that. But when it takes precedence over God, now we have a problem. Secondly, Jacob changes his lifestyle. Look at the end of verse 2. Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and then he says, and change your garments. Be clean and change your garments. When we get away from Bethel and away from God, there is a tendency to go back to pagan and a worldly lifestyle. We are to look and live in love like Christians look and live in love. But when people get away, they'll take, they take on the lifestyle of the world. Jacob called for separation. Paul said, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So clean up. Change your garments. He said, look right. 
walk right, live right, talk right, and do right. You know in Acts chapter 11, they were called Christians because they acted like Jesus. That's why they were, they weren't Christians because, well, they, they say they're Christians because they believe in Jesus. No, they acted like Christians. Because it was their lifestyle. We are to do away with our idols. We are to change our lifestyle. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things. There's a song that we sing sometimes with the young, younger people. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. And there's about 304 verses to that song, or however many you want to, depending on how much time you're trying to use up, I guess, is how many verses you sing. But it's, it is a true song. You want to do right now, and you don't want to do wrong, so you stop doing the wrong, and you start doing the right. The third thing was this, <clears throat> and I want you to look at verse 3. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Jacob remembered what God had done in the past. You know, every so often, it's a good idea to remember what God has done for you in the past. Ever notice how some people forget God after their life was in a mess and it gets somewhat in order and things are going good now, and so now... They forget God. And then their life turns back into a mess. And so they run. They're kind of like the children of Israel in the book of Judges. Then they run back to God and they get their life somewhat in order again. And that cycle just repeats itself over and over and over again. They keep forgetting God. Have you ever sat down and pondered or written a list of what God has done for you? You know that song we sing, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Have you ever sat down and said, well, God did this? Thought a little while, oh yeah, God did that. Thought a little while longer, God did this other thing here. Count your blessings and remember what God has done for you before. Verse 3 shows us God's deliverance and presence. God delivered Jacob when Jacob was in distress. God was with him when he was headed away from Esau. Psalm 103 and verses 1 and 2. And uh, let, let me turn over there real quick. <clears throat> Psalm 103. Verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Don't forget them. Count your blessings. Let me ask you something. Am I guilty? Are you guilty of forgetting what God has done for you in the past? Remember the blessings that God has done for you. Don't ever, and I mean never, Forget them. Now I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 8, 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God and not keeping his commandments. Man, don't forget that. And his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses, dwelt therein, when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, <clears throat> and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And thou shalt, and thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. You are verily foolish to say that. Verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant with which he sware unto thy fathers that it was this day. And it shall be, 
If thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Do not forget what God has already done for you. You're blessed. I'm blessed. Fourthly, he returned to God and he returned to the altar. Go back uh, to our text in Genesis chapter 35. Verse 3. <clears throat> well, that don't read right. That's the wrong book. Genesis 35, 3. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And then verse 7. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. Remember that altar speaks, okay, in the law it was the place, and most people think about this when they think of the altar. Well, that's where they made all the animal sacrifices, and that's true. But this happens to be before the law, and they built the altar, and it speaks of a place of worship and sacrifice and devotion. Did you notice verse 7 where it said, El Bethel? The God of the house of God. He re you know what Jacob did? He returned to God. He got serious about God, and he got serious about the house of God. We serve the God of the house of God. Now listen, don't get caught up in things of the church and forget God. Or as Paul said, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Although you are not supposed to separate God from church in a true sense, you can separate them, humanly speaking. Their focus, our focus, my focus, focus, your focus, it must be on God, not just the church. It's got to be on God, the God of holiness, the God of purity, the God of righteousness, on the God who saves, on the God who sanctifies us, and on the God who secures us, on the God who gives us life and light and love and liberty and power on the God of the valley as well as the God on the mountain. We return to him and we focus on him. Our focus is on God. We won't have any trouble putting and keeping the church where she needs to be if we keep our focus on the Lord because we understand how important the church is in the eyes of God. It isn't hard to serve God when all is well. Everybody's healthy. Paychecks are good. Food is in the cupboards, freezers are full, clothes are in the closet. Man, and you're on a mountaintop. But in the valley, remember the old song, up on the mountain, life is easy, but then down in the valley when things get tougher. Down in the valley of despair, and some people get to where they are in despair. And the valley of discouragement, and some people get just down in despondency and disappointment. And some people even get down into the valley of depression. Can you still serve God then? If your focus is right, you can. Because you're not focused on your circumstances. You're focused on the Lord. You know what the key to that is? Cast your eyes upon Jesus. That's the key. Look full in his wonderful face. You just keep your eyes on Jesus. A poet wrote this. Turn back to where you left him, and you will find him there. But isn't that exactly what Jacob did? He went back to Bethel. So he said, turn back to where you left him, and you will find him there. He is waiting by your bedside where you used to kneel in prayer. He is standing in the chapel but that long abandoned pew, or by that long abandoned pew. You are older, wiser, and broken. You're tired of self, tis true. So return to where you left him. He's waiting there for you. You know what a person should do if they've got away from God a little bit, if that's you? You go back to where you were right with God, and you just start all over again. And just keep going for forward for the Lord. You return to Bethel. 
You return to the God of the house of God. You return to the place of prayer. You put away the idols out of your life. You change your lifestyle to one of purity and holiness and godliness and righteousness. And you remember what God has done for you and you serve him and you live for the true and living God. So let me encourage you. Now, most of you here tonight, I think you say, Pastor, I'm doing all of those things. Well, let me say this. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. I think, I hope I'm wrong, but I think as days go on and uh, under the new administration that we have and the policies that they're putting in place, I think for Christians things could get a little tougher. But you know what you do? You just keep doing the right thing. Just keep doing doing, and I appreciate you, I appreciate your faithfulness, I appreciate your dedication, I appreciate your service to the Lord, just keep doing it. Don't wander away from God, but if you have, come back to Bethel, come back to the God of the house of God, and just keep serving him, and don't stop, and don't quit, and don't throw in a towel because of craziness, and disappointments, and discouragements, and depressions, and despairs, and all, don't, don't, don't stop. Just keep serving God. And I thank you that you do. Father, thank you for this little lesson from the life of Jacob. We could spend seven, eight weeks on his life. But I thank you that you came down and you touched him and you changed him. He got the idols out. <clears throat> he cleaned up his life. Got his lifestyle changed. Dedicated to you. Came back home to the house of God. Came back to the altar, the place of prayer and worship. Got his life right, got his life in order. <clears throat> that's what anybody here that's kind of slipping away needs to do. But if, and I do believe this, I do believe that most people here are fine in those areas, but I don't know what goes on in their homes. But I will tell you, Lord, I pray that they'd never decide to quit. They'd never walk away from you. They'd stay faithful. They'll be determined to never, never, never quit on you regardless of the circumstances and the situations around them. So bless them, Father. Bless our church family. May they continue to grow in grace and nurture in the admonition of the Lord and the love of the Father. May they exalt and honor you in all they say and do and think. And I'll certainly be grateful, and I'm sure you'll be more grateful than I am. In Jesus' name, amen.